Welcome, everyone, to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison, the chair of the history department at Suffolk University and chair of Rev250's advisory board. Rev250 is a consortium of history groups in and around New England looking at ways of promoting and commemorating the story of the American Revolution. And today we are delighted to have with us really one of the most prolific scholars and writers about the story of the revolution, Nathaniel Philbrick. Welcome. Thanks so for joining us. It's great to be with you, Bob. It's great, great to have you. Um, I'll just say briefly that Nat Philbrick, Nathaniel Philbrick, was born in Boston, grew up in Pittsburgh, got a bachelor's degree in English from Brown University, and he was also Brown's first intercollegiate All-American sailor in 1978. And then he got a master's in American literature from Duke, so his real focus was literature. He has written about Moby Dick, he has written about the Pilgrims, and for the last decade he has been writing about the American Revolution, and which is great for the story of the Revolution. Now, your first book on the Revolution was about Bunker Hill. Um, terrific book. Can you tell us a little bit about how that book came into being? Yeah, well, you know, I thought that was going to be the only book about the Revolution. What The way I got into it, I live on Nantucket Island, an island with a population year round of about 15,000. And uh, one of the, when I was a kid, um, you know, I, I was it, into, you know, revolutionary type things. And, uh, and for a year, my wife and I and our, our baby lived in the north end of Boston. And it was pushing her carriage through those crooked streets that I began to think back, you know, what was this city like? What was this community like? Um, as the pressures, you know, Johnny Tremaine was the one I was channeling. What, what was it like then? And so I, um, I, I, I can't, I, that was an image that was big to, big to me. In fact, some of the first history research I did was before we moved to Nantucket, was looking into Boston's evolution uh, from its beginnings to where it was, just the, the topographical things. And so I uh, had just finished uh, The Last Stand, which is about the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, which is a battle book. And I now wanted to look at the community of Boston, what happened to this 15, because there were 15,000 people in Boston, then it was an island that was 1.1 square miles, and it was nothing like the Boston we know today. It was connected to Roxbury by this thin neck of land. I wanted to write a book about what happened uh, to this community um, as the pressures of a revolution mounted and finally erupted uh, with the Battle of Bunker Hill. And this was as you know, revolutions were happening throughout the Middle East. Uh, America was looking at revolution as uh, instant um, uh, arrival of democracy, you know, and um, as we've seen, that's not necessarily how it works. And I, I just wanted to explore how, you know, how what happened up, uh, yeah. in, in Boston. Yeah, and the two characters that really emerge in that book are Warren and Gage as these kind of counterpuntal figures in that, which, yeah, and the book did a lot, I think, to revive the historical legacy of General Warren, who dies at Bunker Hill. Uh, well, you know, he the, he was the 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 figure that really brought the story alive to me. I you know I had heard of him, but I had no no idea of his importance because he died at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, and, you know, one of the great what ifs, um, and in fact, a loyalist after the fact, Peter Oliver said, you know, if Warren hadn't died there would have been no Washington, which is intriguing uh, to contemplate. But he was a, a figure that large uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in Boston at yes. that time yeah. and that yeah. talent. Yes, really amazing. Now, thinking of Johnny Tremaine, you've also written Ben's Revolution, which is a young person's perspective on what's happening. Can you tell us a bit about that book? Yeah. Well, that I story? Had, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I uh, I'd finished Bunker Hill and um, had latched on to this character, Benjamin Russell, um, you know, just because with my books, it's it's all about the people and the evidence and um, and they drive what will emerge as the storyline. And the great thing about Benjamin Russell, he was a kid as this uh, as Lexington and Concord was unfolding. Um, he he uh, you know, he would write about it later. 
um, and he would get caught up in it, uh, end up, uh, he and his buddies would follow the, 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 the British, British out of Boston uh, as they were trying to reinforce the British that were in the midst of Concord and Lexington Concord, and he would get caught. He couldn't get back, and hmm. he would eventually be a part of, uh, you know, Putnam's uh, division and uh, would uh, witness the Battle of Bunker Hill. And so uh, that was like, that was a story that was too good to be true. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. and so I felt that, you know, it would be a good book for kids. Yeah. Does he go out to become the publisher of a newspaper in Boston? Yes. That's the same yes. Benjamin Russell? Um, yeah. Um, probably, you know, there's Isaiah Thomas, but there's yeah. also um, Benjamin Russell. And he would, uh, when it, he would be the one who would coin the phrase when James... President James Monroe um, uh, went on his tour of the states and came to Boston, and he would coin the phrase, um, you know, "era of good feelings." And um, you know, so yeah, he he just a, a fascinating character, and to yeah. see him as a kid makes it all yeah. look interesting. Yeah, and now it's great to be able to discover these people's stories as opposed to the kind of the meta narrative that many of us carry in our heads. And it's one of the great things you do in your books, looking at how these folks, you know, we have Warren, we also have Russell, the kid, who goes on to be prominent. Now, um, the couple of the books you've done recently, you know, Valiant Ambition looks at one of the most extraordinary characters in the story of the revolution, you know, Benedict Arnold, who has, yeah. Uh, can you tell us a bit about you know what led you to Arnold as a story? Right? Yeah, well, well, my mother uh, uh, was a big Benedict Arnold fan when I was wow. growing up. Um, wow. And why is and that? She had read Rabbles in Arms, I think, and yeah. um, you know, I, and she, you know, and she was also a contrarian, loved to um, you know needle mm -hmm. people, and uh, particularly her children, but um, but in a good way. And uh, as I was finishing up Bunker Hill, I, um, I, you know, I just had to follow the story. I had become fascinated mm -hmm. with Washington. Um, you know, what is going to happen to Washington next? But who, who to pair him up with? And it was really my mother's fascination with uh, Arnold that led me to examine that. And it just seemed the perfect pairing from my perspective. You know, Washington mm -hmm. goes from a truly a leader in trouble. <laughs> particularly after uh, the Battle of Brooklyn and mm -hmm. uh, to becoming the indispensable man while uh, Arnold be, goes from being almost the indispensable yeah. man, you know, with Valcour Island and all these other, um, uh, particularly Saratoga, and then go, becoming yeah. the one who, who uh, is a traitor. And so I, uh, that, that led me to pair it up, you know, and it was also, I had, it was, researching Bunker Hill, uh, that I really got into how much this was a civil war, you know, mm -hmm. that this yeah. was not uh, the colonials versus the British alone by any means. This was an internal, um, you know, we before we could uh, fight the British, we really had to fight it out among ourselves, and um, which was ongoing, obviously, oh, yeah. conflict. Yeah. And so that all led me to right. write my ambition. Yeah, it's one of the reasons the British anticipated not losing is because the Americans were going to spite them against themselves so much that I think it was General Clinton who said, "Why don't we just pull back to Florida and Canada and let them fight it out, and they'll get tired of killing each other, and will ask us to come back." It's, uh, and that strategy might very well have have won it. Um, yeah, no need to go to Yorktown. <laughs> just, That's right. Yeah, just stay down south and and, and yeah. see what yeah. unfolds. Yeah, it really shows us too. Uh, we were talking earlier. You know, you started writing these in the midst of Arab Spring when there was great hope for democracy arriving. But I, I think we know the easy part is getting rid of the bad old government. The much more difficult part is putting together one that won't be as oppressive or worse than what you've replaced. And that is, I mean, and that is the the un inherent drama in the revolution for me is that, yeah. you know. We're rebels in one sense, yeah. but um, the most important sense is having enough, enough cohesion, um, you know, enough of, you know, a government, and it's very mm -hmm. almost impossible to sustain anything effective right. in the midst of a, a war. But that is the miracle of it all. Mm -hmm. That um, there, you know, we we came through it with the ability mm -hmm. 
um, you know, move move forward yeah. in that in a good way. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm just because you wrote, you know, Mayflower is a sweeping book that covers the whole 18th, 17th century, but here you focused very specifically on parts of the revolution. Is that intentional or do you plan at some point to write a sweeping overview? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I try to make every book different. Um, mm -hmm. I just get bored um, doing the same thing. And, you know, with In the Heart of the Sea, it was a survival tale. But in a way, all my books are survival tales, yeah. perhaps. But um, and I also am working my way through American history, but also geographically. I'm, I'm just fascinated with the variety of this country, the cultural differences. And so what the revolution uh, provided me with was a chance, you know, the way it, it begins in New England, it moves into the middle Atlantic states and then really culminates down south. And so right. that for me, that was a really attractive uh, mm -hmm. way to do it. And, and the other challenge was to um, make each book different, just in terms yeah. of narrative structure, uh, characters, and things like that. Because I, I, I really like to, you know, each one for me is, is, is you know, something to test, test me as a storyteller, right. because um, um, it's, it's uh, once I get into a rut, it, it just, the, the, the fire dies. Right, right, yeah. In the hurricane's eye again, it, it, it does take the story up and does those really pivotal years between Saratoga and Yorktown. Can you, you know, how did again each of these books has to be different because it really is a different story you're telling at each Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and that was one of the attractions of the revolution is how it. Um, it was it was interesting for me to try to figure out. Okay, now. How am I going to structure? Because it was after Bunker Hill, I realized, okay, I want to see the revolution through, but how am I going to do it? And so there was the Benedict Arnold Washington pairing. But what really attracted me um, to what became the material that became uh, in the hurricane's eye was the fact that there is a, a maritime battle. I had not right. yet, you know, I'm yeah. often uh, pegged as a maritime guy and, um, and, and Patrick O'Brien is one of my favorite novelists of all time. And uh, this would give me an opportunity to do, you know, a, a, uh, one of those, it's not Napoleonic, but it's, it's basically the same technology and mm -hmm. in many cases, the same ships and same men. Mm -hmm. um, it would give me a chance to do one of those, those slugfests yeah. at sea. And, right. you know, and it also, because I, I also, for, you know, I, I write to a general readership and I, I think um, a lot of people have misconceptions about our past, uh, particularly when it comes to Yorktown, that it was, mm -hmm. you know, a terrestrial victory uh, faded uh, from the mm -hmm. very beginning. Um, no, it was a mm -hmm. series of random events made possible uh, by a, a naval, uh, uh, you know, confrontation yeah. in which no Americans were involved. And this is not the narrative Americans necessarily want to attach to how we uh, gained our independence. Yeah, it is one of the most pivotal naval battles in American history. By the way, Peg is a naval this maritime historian. I should say Nathaniel Philbrick, our guest, is the recipient of the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award from the USS Constitution Museum, as well as the Nathaniel Bowditch Award from the American Merchant Marine. So you're carrying awards named for two of the most eminent people in maritime history one historian and the other, the guy who wrote Bowditch's Navigator. I mean, um, that is a way of being pegged, I guess, is a, but you've done lots of other things, as you said. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Battle of the Chesapeake or the Battle of the Capes? Yeah, um, you know, and what made it interesting for me is I, I grew up a competitive sailor and uh, in that noble craft, the sunfish. And uh, I sailed as a teenager in the Sunfish uh, North Americans at Fort Monroe, uh, which is just down wow. the peninsula from Yorktown. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've sailed those very waters. And, um, you know, current is a huge factor, um, all sorts of things. And so that brought the material really home to me. Um, I, I also, as a kid, sailed in the Sunfish Worlds in Martinique, um, you know, where the French fleet uh, right was at one point before it made its 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 venture north uh to the chesapeake and and so um you know this was a battle uh that uh washington had been desperate for uh french maritime support he knew the only way he could 
do a knockout blow that might win this thing was if the French neutralized the British Navy because uh, the British had complete control over the seaboard. And uh, But to coordinate the French Navy with his army was a very difficult thing to do with, at, you know, given the technologies involved. And, you know, he was hopeful. It, for him, it only made sense to do it in New York because uh, that's where the British were dug in and there was a large enough army that could uh, change the balance. But um, the French were afraid of sailing into uh, New York Harbor, rightfully so. It's, it's a tough one. So they thought the Chesapeake was a better idea. And, um, and but who knew um, uh, Lord Cornwallis would make the decision to to just hang out in Yorktown, uh, even as a huge fleet arrived. Um, without that, without that, um, that the whole strategy never would have worked. And Washington was quite right in saying, "Why would Cornwallis hang out <laughs> and let this yeah. happen?" But it did, and so it's one of the more improbable uh, uh, events. Um, you know, and in the book, I go, you know, there's hur hurricanes involved. They're, you know, the French don't have the money, but the Spanish and Cuba give them a loan. You know, all of these things had to happen uh, for it to go the way it did. Yeah. And it did is, is, is a miracle, but it's also the culmination of a strategy Washington was trying to employ ever since the French joined uh, the American Revolution. Right. It worked very well. It hadn't worked so well in Rhode Island when they tried it. And then, of course, the British do. Um, they have a rematch a year or two later in the in the Caribbean, which goes right. the British way, which goes the other way. And yeah. you know that's the other side of it. Now you could say uh, the only reason we're an independent country is that Admiral Rodney had prostate problems and had to go to England uh, for surgery mm -hmm. rather than lead the British fleet. Uh, mm. If he'd been there, um, it, yeah. it definitely would have been a very different battle. And and. I would think that, you know, I'd yeah. guess gone the other way. Yeah, there are all, I mean, it's these what ifs that yeah. make it, you know, so history isn't simply a list of dates, but it is these events where people are making these choices. I'm, I'm wondering how your opinion of Washington has changed over the course of writing these books. Your first one, you know, Warren is the guy. And but by the way, I'm glad you cited Peter Oliver because my wife is always throwing up at me. Nathaniel Philbrick says, if there were, if Warren hadn't died, we never would have heard of George Washington. And I always say, I don't think that's true, but now it's not you, it's um, Peter Oliver. And I'm happy to bash Peter Oliver rather than Yeah, Nathaniel no, it's Philbrick. okay. You know, and it was a way for Peter Oliver to needle Washington. Um, oh, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, you know yeah. so you, you can't. But, you know, the, he had a point. Um, yeah. You know, and my, my um, appreciation of Washington evolved, as did Washington. You know, uh, based on Bunker Hill, I have to say I wasn't very impressed. Um, yeah. uh, he it was he wanted to attack the British directly, uh, yeah. even though he didn't have enough gunpowder, which would have been suicidal. It was Ward's um, suggestion that we fortify uh, the heights, right? Off, which Washington resisted. Uh, eventually, you know, it happens, and Washington gets the credit, and then. Mm -hmm. You know, and then comes the you know the the the, the terrible uh, outcome at, at, at the, the Battle of, of Long Island or, or right. Brooklyn, yeah, New right. York, yeah. You know, and then you know he comes back um, with the greatest comebacks of all time, yeah. at Trenton. Uh, but you know, this is not a leader uh, that's that's you know uh, stable. <laughs> you know, in yeah, a way. yeah, yeah. And with, he's a man without a strategy. It's desperate. Mm -hmm. It's flailing. And um, and it was with valiant ambition where I began to realize the political genius of Washington, because that's really what emerges. That's what um, uh, uh, the America needed, and yeah. um, and that's what made him the truly indispensable man. The other stuff was um, yeah, because it would have been meaningless without a person of Washington's stature holding mm -hmm. it together. So, yeah, and then uh, after Yorktown, um, you know, after writing uh, that book, um, you know, watch, watching him um, at, at, at uh, you know, standing up to his officers just months before yeah. the British evacuation and saying, you know, we're, we're, you know, 
you're, we're not going to march on Continental Congress mm -hmm. and demand our pay at gunpoint. Um, he saves the Union there. He surrenders his commission. So I came away with, um, you know, a man who uh, um, uh, evolved from a young hothead uh, with mm -hmm. a chip on his shoulder after a very checkered career um, in the in the uh, Seven Years' War yeah. to uh, a, a, a true um, uh, leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your forthcoming book also is about Washington. Can, do you want to give us a tip about I'd love to. Yeah. So yeah. It's called Travels with George in Search of Washington and His Legacy. And after I completed uh, my three books about the revolution, I, I just, you know, I, I never saw it coming. I never saw um, becoming so infatuated with Washington. But what was going to happen next? Um, and, uh, you know, and when Washington became president, even before he was president, he realized he was now the leader of 13 essentially independent states. Um, mm -hmm. There really was no sense of national unity. When a Virginian said, my country, he meant Virginia. He didn't mean yeah. the United States. Uh, and there was a political divide as deep as anything we're feeling today between anti-federalists and federalists who were for the Constitution. And the only thing they could agree on is Washington should be the leader. And, um, and so he realized he had a huge challenge if he was going to establish a, a durable government. And so he went on a series of road trips. Um, he uh, went, uh, you know, he went, he did New England all the way up to Kittery Point, Maine. He went all the way south to Savannah, Georgia. You know, he traveled not in Air Force One, but in a horse-drawn carriage. You know, it was three months uh, was the Southern tour. And so, uh, you know, I was getting, uh, you know, on a personal level, I was getting itchy uh, in my this basement office here on Nantucket. I wanted to see the country I'd been writing about. And so, uh, and one of my favorite books of all time is uh, John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. Right. I'd had the uh, joy of meeting uh, his widow, Elaine, on Nantucket mm -hmm. years ago. And I said, you know, my wife was retiring. We had just gotten a puppy named Dora, a Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. I said, let's hit the road and follow George. And so thus was born Travels with George. And so it's as much about Washington's tour of America uh, as it is ours. I, you know, and I didn't want to talk. I wasn't into figuring out what divides us, um, you know, because we, yes, there are great divisions in this country. I was curious about what uh, holds us together. And what did Washington do at the very beginning to try to pull this country together? So um, it's uh, it, it, it was just a fun year and a half yeah. of following Washington around the country, uh, going, yes, he slept just about everywhere, yeah. it seems, but visiting those places, talking to historians and museum professionals. Before I headed out, I, um, I contacted, you know, Washington visited more than 100 towns, mm -hmm. 60 in uh, New England alone. Mm -hmm. And so I contacted as many of the li libraries and historical societies of each town as I could. And soon I was just getting all of this, you know, yeah. all, you know like to, to pair, you know, Tip O'Neill said all politics is local, yeah. all history, I think, is local. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, the book is about history, about Washington, um, about the divided nature of our very beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, where are we headed? That's great. And it really is one of the reminders of how much, how people in so many towns are invested in their history, the story of what happened here. And so Washington's visit is still an important thing for oh, these Oh, it places. is. And it's not just plaques. It's not, you yeah. know, it's not just Washington slept here. Uh, there are anecdotes of, of a young woman who is six years old in Oyster Bay when Washington you know, comes down the road uh, you know, and, um, you know, she would live to be in her 90s and remember mm -hmm. this. And, you know, and it's and it's not the Washington we think the stayed, uh, you know, remote mm -hmm. individual. This is Washington gets off his horse and helps raise the rafter to a one schoolroom house they wow. built. You know, I mean, wow. so it's it's you know, it's Washington and the traveler, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the human being. Uh, it's, it was just it was an amazing experience for both Melissa and I. And um, yeah. And Dora. Yeah, seem to enjoy it too. Wow. 
Now, uh, again, it's one of the things that makes us think about the nature of the country that emerges, and you have written a bit about this, but I think one of the most interesting ways you've explored what comes next is in your work on Moby Dick, the great 19th century book about so many things. So what drew, why should we read Moby Dick? Uh, Moby Dick, uh, for me, is our American Bible. I mean, it contains um, the, the cultural, um, uh, polit political, I mean, it, it contains everything in there. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's what America would become is in Moby Dick, um, uh, written in 1851. I think one of the reasons why it fell on deaf ears when it was published was that Melville saw with intense clarity um, where America was headed. It was not only headed for the Civil War, it was headed for uh, a world post World War One, you know, and mm -hmm. and that's you know after that it was embraced. So to read Moby Dick is to see, um, uh, you know, I think it's a metaphysical um, survival guide. You know, the the it's it's about a people on the brink of a disaster that mm -hmm. are racing hell bent right. to disaster. And you know what? We are always racing hell bent to disaster. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to think the past was a more, you know, uh, an easier time where right, they knew yeah. what was happening. No, we've always been on the edge of, you know, it's, it's terrifying. Um, it rattles your faith in everything you believe, but that is the nature of life. Um, mm. And, you know, so, so for me, Moby Dick, and, you know, and every book I write, I, I work Moby Dick into it in some way. And um, so for me, it's, it's the touchstone uh, mm -hmm. that really has inspired my, my career. Yeah, I was just thinking, too, the other book we've been talking about a little, you know, Steinbeck refers to the monster country he's trying to understand yes. in the same yes. way. Um, but then that raises a question. I mean, uh, I, I don't want to ask you about whether you have faith in America or do you think there's going to, or, you know, is there always an Ahab or is there um, a Washington? Uh, thinking about two poles of leadership. Um, yeah. You got to read Travels with George um, mm -hmm. because, hey, Washington is not perfect, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to slavery. There's right. more than a bit of Ahab in Washington, as there is in any great leader. As, as um, Melville says in Moby Dick, all mortal greatness, all mortal greatness is but disease. And, uh, you know, to get things done to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's, and so I think that's, one of the great lessons of Moby Dick is to understand this world. You cannot uh, insulate, negate, uh, turn your back on evil mm -hmm. because evil is everywhere. It's in all of us. I mean, right. you, there's no one who is perfect. There is no yeah. one. And that, you know, and so I think this, we're, we're just too dismissive and judgmental as a culture. You have mm -hmm. to look at everybody in their complexity mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and realize that you know abhorrent behavior can also accompany redemptive behavior. It's the nature of being a human being. And uh, so for me, history um, and um, is all about that. And and that's where writing travels with George was for me, uh, you know, hugely cathartic uh, because yeah. I had, you know for three books I had been with Washington. Um, and to actually get out, follow him around, understand how hard he worked. I mean, this was, he's president and yeah. he's, he's going on these road trips when uh, Congress is in recess. You know, this is not him kicking back. Mm -hmm. He's worked yeah. immensely hard to, to create something that is not based on the personality of the, the ego of the leader. Mm -hmm. He's working to create something that it will transcend the ego of a leader. He was trying to transcend something uh, with that would transcend him because at that yeah. point, many people said, what's going to be next? You, right. you know, the divisions are going to consume us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and boy, they almost did. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then you have James Monroe on the other end of the Jefferson yeah. dynasty, presidential dynasty. Um, you know, all of those divisions burned themselves out. And, uh, you know, you can argue that American politics is cyclical and, you know, it's kind of 50 years, yeah. of, um, you know, uh, 
So so who knows? But I mean, that's yeah. nobody knows. And if anybody knows, you can tell them. You know. That's right. Yeah. I, I usually advise people, we historians often can tell you what did happen, but when we start telling you what will happen, you should run because, you know, no. yeah. A uh, modesty can only teach you uh, to be modest, to right, uh, right. You know, to uh, to reserve judgment. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask: Have you ever thought of writing fiction? Yeah, I, I tried to as a uh, teenager and a twenty-something guy. Um, you know, I I uh, I have um, I have no ability to imagine. Um, you know, uh, invented worlds. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I wish I did. Yeah. Um, it, would may, it would require a lot less research. But um, you know, I, I I think I can tell a story. Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, you know, if uh, I when I try to you know venture out um, and and stray from what really happened, I think I lose my way. I've I've told my wife many times. If I tell you I'm going to write a novel, slap me. Um, mm -hmm. because it's just, it's not the way my mind is wired. Um, yeah. And uh, I wish it were different, but um, yeah, I, I wrote poetry um, and got it published and things like that uh, when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. and I haven't, I've gotten too obsessed with other things to, to mm -hmm. continue with that. But that's, for me, it was a very different side of my head as to, you know, creating a, a fictive, fictive mm -hmm. world. Right. Well, you create a were a nonfiction world very well. So we're talk we've been talking with Nathaniel Philbrook, whose forthcoming book is Travels with George about Washington and Nathaniel Philbrick and his wife and Dora and the country we live in. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you all for listening to the Rev two fifty podcast. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. So thanks Nat. Hey thank you, Bob. It's been a pleasure. Great to talk to you.